Interstate 180 is a junior high and high school youth ministry that meets every Tuesday and is comprised of multiple churches of different denominations in the Dixon, California area. Our vision is for unity within the body of Christ and that true salvation and life change would come to the youth of our area. Weekly podcasts can be found on our YouTube channel and are all free for download. If you would like more info about our ministry, connect with us on our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram at Interstate 180. So just to kind of ramp up where we left off, um, if you guys recall, uh, Moses had been rescued by God, um, just absolutely in an amazing way. Uh, and, and Israel had been pers- uh, being persecuted, right? Uh, God blessed Israel. And how did he bless Israel? He, he gave them um, uh, this uh, call and this, this blessing. This is, you will fill the, the world. You will like, you know, your nation will just absolutely grow and grow and grow. Um, and, and because of that, um, you will know that I am with you, right? Um, and so God began to bless Israel. Um, they're living in Egypt, if you guys recall. And while they're in Egypt, um, they started to grow to the point that Pharaoh was getting a little nervous because he's thinking, okay, this um, nation is getting huge, and what, what would happen if they turn on us? So he basically turns on them. It's kind of like a preemptive strike. Uh, and, and he says, okay, let's put these guys into captivity um, and, and begins to uh, treat them harshly. I mean, very harshly. If you guys look at the pyramids, um, you'll begin to see a little bit of the— sorry, I'm like— pfft. There we go. Uh, a, a little bit of the um, a, a amount of uh, pressure that was placed on these guys. And so here um, we kind of pick up after uh, Moses himself had witnessed um, the rough treatment of the Israelites. And he begins to see um, these Egyptians beating uh, some of his, his fellow Hebrew people. Where was Moses living at this time? in the palace, right? I mean, he's got, like, it all. I mean, you're living in a palace. Everybody's, like, you know, at your beck and call. Um, Everything's legit. Everything's good. Um, And and so he witnesses this attack, and so he goes and he kills the Egyptian who was uh, treating his his Hebrew people uh, roughly, and he buries them in the sand. Uh, What was the the desire behind him killing um, this Egyptian person? Starts with a V and ends with engines. Vengeance, right? He, he sees his, uh, his heart is for justice, right? He has a heart for justice and he sees the injustice and he says, I, I can't stand idly by sitting in my ivory tower and watch my people be treated this way. And so he takes matters into his own hands and he does what? Kills a dude, right? Um, and I truly believe that God placed this desire um, of justice on the heart of Moses. That God preemptively said, I, I, I want to uh, stir in you, Moses, the desire to set my people free. We're going to see in chapter 3, verse 8, um, that God actually says, this is my plan. Um, but this is a little like, you know, uh, all of a sudden he, he just jumps on it, takes matters into his own hands, and he gets himself into trouble. So he flees, right? He leaves the palace and he goes from riches to rags. He, he ends up moving into Midian, uh, which is kind of this horrible desert area. Um, and, and he begins to uh, pine away for 40 years, uh, living this life uh, of servitude for his father-in-law. Um, he ends up becoming a pastor, uh, taking care of uh, a flock in, um, in Midian, and he's there for 40 years. So again, this is like this killing thing happened 40 years later, fast forward, and, and that's where we're going to kind of pick up um, tonight. Uh, I mentioned this whole idea of him going from riches to rags um, because it's kind of opposite of America, right? I, I mean, in America, we kind of have these we glorify, as a culture, I mean, a lot of us are like, well, I don't really care about money. Um, liar. Uh, but anyways, uh, it, there is kind of within our culture this, this um, desire to see someone who, who goes from rags or nothing and, and, and makes something of themselves and builds their own empire. We applaud it, right? Uh, you know, we look at this and say, wow, that is success. That is achievement, to go from rags to riches, God's purpose for Moses was to take him from riches 
and take him to rags. And, and I truly believe there is a, a, a strategy that God uses that is opposite of the strategy that you and I would initially come up with. Because to be honest with you, I, I would be thinking, okay, if God wants to use someone to take his people out of uh, this, this terrible situation where, uh, where they're being uh, controlled by this government, you would want to use someone maybe, I don't know, inside the palace? Someone who's connected to Pharaoh in such a, an amazing way that, that all that he had to do was take the ear of Moses and say, or sorry, of, of Pharaoh and say, hey, these are my people. These are my people that you're treating horribly and, and please, for me, you know, do this. But God decides to do something different. God decides to take him out of power and prestige and have him humbled and use uh, a very um, moving uh, way of showing himself who he is. And not only that, but then use, use uh, Moses um, as he is humbled for that very purpose. God's plan for Moses um, was to first humble him before he uses him. Picking up in Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says this. Now Moses was pasturing uh, the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Uh, so not only, this is 40 years again later after um, he did this killing, and, and he's he doesn't even have his own flock. He's uh, pasturing the flock of his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he left the flock to the west side of wilderness, and he came to Horeb, uh, which is a horrible mountain, which God ends up turning into Mount Sinai, his mountain, and, and placing his presence on. Um, but before, it was just kind of a dust bowl. Uh, the mountain of God. Check this out, verse 2. This is like one of my favorite. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. With, uh, why is this bush not being burned up? Um, quite a response by Moses. I wonder if he dictated this himself, like, later on. Like, what was the verbiage I used? Right, yeah. And so, uh, kind of an amazing thing, right? Anytime we see a fire, it's like, oh, uh, and it draws us in, right? But what was peculiar about this very fire? It didn't burn up the bush, right? So, as Moses is looking at this thing, he's like, something's weird, still like green, still healthy, like bush, not like crumpling in, uh, it's not like turning black, you know, like, like Mikey's marshmallows that he likes to eat, disgusting by the way, um, <laughs> it's gross, uh, carcinogens, anyway, so this, as a sight to be marveled, and he's, he's looking at this, he's drawn into it, right, he's saying, this is Weird. This is really weird because this is outside of the, the realm of normal, right? This, this doesn't happen. Like, what is going on? And so as he's staring at this, he's saying to himself, I must turn aside now and see the marvelous sights. Why the bush is not burned up? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him. This is even weirder. God called to him from the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, probably in a squeaky, high-pitched voice, uh, here I am. Here I am. Then God said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What was Moses' response? The end of verse 6, he said, Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Initially, he sees this bush. It's not, it catches his eye, and he looks and notices something peculiar. That's, it's, it's not being consumed. 
right? And, and so then he begins to say, whoa, this is amazing. This is spectacular. And then the bush starts speaking to him, and he's a little thrown off, right? And he's like, yeah, I'm here. And then he begins to find out what? That the bush is God, right? Um, that God uh, reveals himself um, in this bush. Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, we actually see a few Christophanies. Uh, what would you guys think a Christophany would be? Where God, Jesus, shows up in the Old Testament. Now, is Jesus a bush? <laughs> uh, no, right? Jesus, the angel of the Lord, shows up in this, in this form, and he calls out, and it's a beautiful sight, it's, a, it's a, a, an alluring sight, one that, that, that stopped Moses in his tracks and drew Moses in initially until he began to figure out what? That this bush is God. That the Almighty God made himself known in the midst of this thing. And Moses' response is what? He hides his face. He hides his face in fear because he was afraid to look at God. Moses was, as you and I both can um, attest in our lives, a sinful man. I mean, obviously, he killed a dude. So, uh, yeah, he's definitely not batting a thousand, right? He's definitely not pure. He's definitely not perfect. And, and, and the cool thing about this story is that I see that when we experience Jesus in our lives, we have this initial drawing, this almost this sense of like, come to me, see who I am. And, and we're drawn by this beauty either uh, through, before we become Christians, right? Before, you know, through either just really sweet people who love Jesus and, and there's something about them that I just want to get close to them and get to know them because something's weird here. They're so sweet. They're so nice. They're so loving. They're so whatever. And maybe some of you guys experienced miraculous things. Maybe some of you guys got to know someone and they cared about you and, and that drew you in to know a little bit about this amazing, spectacular thing within them. This light. It's almost as if this person was shining uh, and you were drawn to them. And in that relationship, you get to come closer to understand who Christ is. And the hard thing about Jesus is this, that initially when you see Jesus as he is, he's open arms and saying what? I love you. I love you. But the closer you get to Christ, the more you see his holiness and the more you see your dirt bagginess, <laughs> the more you begin to recognize, oh no, I, I fear. Because you begin to see the very fact that you are a broken individual, that you are not as good as you think you are. And in that moment, you begin to become afraid. Now, we know that Jesus presents himself and says, uh, I've taken care of that and I've, I've provided a way. But many people re choose to reject Jesus in that moment because of fear of seeing themselves. You see, when we're in the darkness, when we're separated from Christ, it's like, nah, no big deal. I'm just kind of roving around with a bunch of people in the dark, and we don't really see each other's issues. I mean, we do, but we don't really care about it. Uh, we don't really know what holiness is until you experience Christ. And, and when Christ begins to show himself to you, you begin to have a moment where you say, do I choose to follow him or do I choose to reject him? maybe some of you guys have experienced that with a friend where at first they started kind of hanging out with you and, and you're loving on them and you're taking care of them and you're thinking oh this is going so well and you're ministering to them but then they come to a decision point where all of a sudden they realize wow I don't know if I like this I feel a little uncomfortable you guys Jesus brings us to a point where we have to make a decision to repent from the ways of this world, the philosophies that we've grown up with, those, those feelings, those natural desires. And we have to come to face those things and reject them and follow Christ. 
And that's why when we see, when we see Jesus' ministry, you see crowds of people following him because of his teachings, following him because of his miracles, following because of his kindness and his love. But then as he began to teach and teach and teach and reveal more of his righteousness, many people said no. They walked away. They became afraid because they began to see the holiness that is Christ, the holiness that is God, and it revealed their brokenness, and they didn't know what to do with it. All the while, Christ is saying, I have paved the way. I have created an opportunity for you to repent. But in their brokenness and in their shame, they walk away. Now, this applies to Christians and non-Christians, right? I mean, how many of us have uh, walked through sin in our lives and, and we just felt so ashamed that we were like, oh, I can't hang out with Jesus tonight. He knows what I did. I, I can't hang out with you, Lord, because I just, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I've been too bad today. I've been too bad today. My wife and I, we were in um, Kona about 10 years ago. I've been married 10 years, dang. Um, uh, 10 years ago, we were in Kona, and um, we were attending this school of ministry, um, kind of a thing, but prior to being sent out. And while we were there, there was this really sweet, like, cute Georgia girl, like, really just nice, but she always had a chip on her shoulder. She had that, like, angry face, but she was, like, this duality. I mean, it was weird. Like, everybody in the, in the school, were, they were like, Jessica's really sweet, but I don't know. There's something wrong. It, it's almost as if there was this, like, anger that was just boiling up around her, but she was trying so hard to be sweet. And so we're doing this ministry time this week that we're supposed to go out and do evangelism stuff, and we're, we're sitting there praying right before we're supposed to go out and evangelize, and all of a sudden, like, God showed up, kind of like at camp, and it was just like ministry time, and things were happening, and this girl, um, this guy named Dudley, calls her out, and he says, I need to talk to you, and so he comes over, and they, they have this ministry time, and he prays over her, and like, just, anyway, crazy ministry time. Uh, I'll go into it another day some, sometime, but literally, she comes, like, from this, you know, from this uh, side and she begins to stand in front of everybody, and we looked at her, and we're like, that is not the same person. Like, physically, that is what happened. And so this guy named Dudley began to explain, um, just like spiritually, what happened with this girl, that, that in a very, in the moment, in a moment, Christ took hold of her and took this thing out of her life. She repented, and, and her physical appearance changed. Her love for people changed. And the rest of that time, I remember thinking, wow, God, you can take someone who is like having this duality of, of, of just fighting with herself and just so cranky and uptight and just her face was always just clenched, but she just wanted to be nice and was so southern and very like, ah, but, but angry to being this sweet, wonderful person, just shining Christ. And all it took was a moment of repentance. A moment of repentance. So we always wonder, okay, man, why don't we, in the midst of any moment of shame, guilt, come to the Lord, lay down our sin, and get right with him? It's because of this See, initially we're drawn to the love of Christ and, and we have this moment with him and, and we share in this and all of a sudden it's decision time. Okay, now that you've come and experienced my love, now you're going to choose to follow my commands. You're going to follow my commands. You're going to be holy from here on out. And we were like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going I'm to make this decision. I'm going to be holy from here on out. I'm not going to say anything wrong ever i'm not gonna it's gonna be great and then it happens 
that guilt, that shame comes back. And we, instead of us returning to the cross over and over again like we're supposed to, we begin to hold on to it and begin to become afraid of God. All the while, what is God waiting for? Repentance. For you to draw near. So we see that uh, as Moses sees the love, this, this uh, burning um, symbol of, of God in the form of Christ, he's afraid. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. And I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land uh, to a land and a spacious land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel had come to me furthermore. I have seen the oppression of with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So God begins to say, as Moses is drawn in, he says, I have a plan. I've seen the persecution. I've been waiting for the right time to rescue them uh, from this persecution. And while they've been persecuted, I have held them together. You see, guys, the the beautiful thing about this symbol of this bush not being consumed is this, that the fire that surrounded this bush should have done what to the plant? Should have destroyed it, right? Should have consumed it. And I love in Daniel, uh, when uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you guys know that story, when, um, you know, they're getting tossed into the fiery furnace, and, and the, the king was so angry that he said, don't want it seven times hotter than normal. And so they began to uh, just push this form of oppression and persecution on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they throw them into the fiery furnace. And, and as the guards look, they see not three, but what? Four people walking around, unsinged and set free from their, their bounds. You see, the very flames that were surrounding uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, were persecution. And God sustained them through that. In fact, it's Jesus who's in there with them, the angel of the Lord inside of the furnace, uh, holding them together, keeping them from being consumed by the fire. You guys, we see in Micah and Malachi and also in uh, all over the New Testament and through the Psalms, um, this idea that you and I as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are uh, refined by the fire. That, that God takes these external persecutions um, in our lives and what is the purpose of those things? Well, if you look at precious silver or precious gold, the refiner is uh, a skilled, masterful person. Who, who heats the metal to uh, the exact um, degrees that need to be. And this was before thermometers and like those little testing things. So they just kind of worked off of like color and stuff. But God's really good at what he does. So what he does is he allows the, the heat, the pressure to come into your lives. The persecution. And what comes up is the badness comes out is the goodness, but comes up is the badness, and then they skim those impurities off the top. See, I love that God has purpose inside of persecution. And so even as these Israelites are being uh, treated like slaves and, and just abs hor- hor- horribly treated, God says, I've got a purpose for it. I'm going to sustain them through it. And in fact, I'm going to use it to make them shine all the brighter so that more people will be attracted to them and they will have to come to a point where they see me and they will have to make a decision to follow me or to reject me. See, the problem is about us is we like the shiny part. We like to, to uh, like, love on people. We want to do, like, miraculous things and sweet things and be kind to people and draw all kinds of people to us, but we don't want them to what? To leave. 
It's a dangerous thing as Christians uh, that when we come to those points in our lives where we are drawing people because of Christ's love in us and showing out, uh, being sweet and kind to the rest of the world, that those people come to us and they're unwilling to, to repent. And so instead of us saying, please repent, come and, 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 and follow after what God has for you, and if they choose to walk away, to walk away, but instead oftentimes we follow them and take them and say, okay, well, uh, you don't have to fully repent. We can just kind of keep on working on this, keep on working on this, keep on working on this. And then slowly we get pulled away. We get embarrassed or ashamed about being righteous because people call us judgmental. And instead of us standing to a standard and, and holding to a standard where uh, maybe even friends of us, ours who are believers are walking off and doing things that are not right in, in the eyes of God, that, that we don't say anything. That we don't stand up and say, hey, this isn't who we are. We don't do those things. We don't walk that way. Out of fear of persecution, we no longer hold people to a standard. We no longer glorify righteousness, but we kind of muddle around like the rest of the world as if nothing has changed in our lives. In John chapter 15, Jesus is um, getting ready to leave, um, first to die and then to uh, head up to heaven. And this is kind of his last message it's the one about Jesus being the vine. Um, and, and he says, please connect with me, abide in me, and, and I will be uh, the source of love for you to change the world. But that source of love is going to bring about one thing. He says in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You guys see, this is exactly what's going on in Israel, or in Egypt with the Israelites. God was pouring out his blessing on these people, and they saw in them the blessing of God, and they were jealous, they were angry, they were against everything that God was doing, and so they began to treat them harshly. He says, remember the world, uh, the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will pers also persecute you. If they ke kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, and it continues on, but uh, what Jesus is saying is this. People will be drawn to you if you are following after Jesus. And as you're following after Jesus and you continue to stand on the holiness that God has called you to live according to, persecution will come. Persecution will come. But if you're afraid of what people think about you, if you love the world in a way that, that you don't want to offend, I promise you this, people will be drawn to you, but then you'll be drawn away with them. See, we have to begin to say, uh, I, I choose to follow Christ, and that means that I long to live according to the principles that he has laid before me. I want to follow him and, and the, the commands that he has given to me. Now, are any of us perfect? And I go back to the beginning where I say, you know what? Again, there's times where we, where we do make mistakes, and guess what? God says, repent. Get back right in line with me. But again, out of fear or maybe out of feeling like we're going to be judgmental, we just hold on to it. We have to, have to, have to uh, choose to let Christ reign in our lives. As lights in this world, people will be drawn to us just like Moses stared at the fire and something was peculiar. Something was different about 
this fire, that it wasn't consuming this very thing. So even as you are walking through difficulties in your life and you're living according to Christ, finding strength in Christ in the midst of uh, difficult times, people will see that and they'll be drawn to it. And the wonder of it all is that God uses us to draw people to him. I want to close with this um, last story, and then we'll split up into small groups. But um, back in 1999, when I started uh, to attend college, um, my parents, um, my brother was getting married, and they all flew to Georgia, and I came down to, to Redding, California from Seattle, and I got dropped off and, and um, you know, headed over to the wedding. And so everybody else kind of had been there for a few days, getting ready for my oldest brother's wedding. And my middle brother and I, one day we were like, hey, let's like, you know, cross the freeway. Don't do this, by the way. Uh, let's cross the freeway, hop over this fence, and then go on to Callaway Gardens. Callaway Gardens is like this epically huge golf course for those who know. You know what Callaway Gardens is? Yeah, you're a golfer. Um, and, and so this is a beautiful golf course. Inside of this golf course, they have a man-made lake with like tons of like, uh, just, it's insane. And so my brother and I rush across the freeway, hop over this fence, and, and we start to kind of meander through um, the uh, f- fairways and past every, you know, golfers and getting yelled at and everything else, like through the trees. And we finally get to this man-made lake. We spend about two hours there kind of hanging out. And then we run back and hop over the fence. And as I'm hopping over the fence, my wallet falls out of my pants. And so I kind of land on the other side, and I'm like, oh, my wallet. So I climb back over the fence, grab it, and my brother, my older brother, was like, oh, no. I'm like, what? He goes, I lost my wallet, too. I'm like, that's just weird. And so I'm like, well, whatever, because in my wallet, um, I had my driver's license and my student ID, and that's it. So it's like, you know, no big deal, but apparently engineers roll a different way. He had $700 in his, in his wallet. And I'm like, what are you thinking? He was like, well, I was going to buy my girlfriend something. I'm like, oh. So we hop back over the fence, and we're looking around in the media area. You know, we're checking out stuff. We're looking for like 15 minutes. And I'm like, this is stupid. Lord, you know where this is. Show it to me. And I said it out loud, and I prayed out loud just a simple prayer like that. And all of a sudden, I don't know why. Well, I do know why, because God told me to. I just started running. So I'm running and running and running, go through, you know, the, the way, all the way, kind of heading back toward um, the lake. And all of a sudden, I'm getting, going through these bushes, and I stop. And in my heart, I'm just thinking, okay, I just ran like half a mile, and my brother is nowhere in sight. He doesn't care about this wallet. Why am I looking so frantically for it? So I stop, and as I'm spinning around, I see this bush glowing in my mind. I mean, it just stood out. It was weird. It was like this moment that uh, nothing else really existed, and this bush was brighter to me. And I walked up to it, and guess what's inside of the bush? The wallet. Pick it up, ran back, and there my brother is at that, you know, fence line. And I walk up to him, and I'm like holding it. And he's just like, what the heck? I was a kid that went to youth group all the time. I, I was kind of the, the, you know, the Christ follower of the, of the three boys. And they all, my other brothers believed in Jesus, but my, my middle brother didn't want anything to do with God until that moment. I remember looking at him and see him just connecting with God in that moment. It's such a cool thing that, that when we actually live our lives on purpose, that God begins to make things stand out to you. And you begin to, to, I mean, it wasn't anything about me, right? It had nothing to do with me, but God began to say, like, I want to show you ways that you can draw people to me. And just in that simple thing, which wasn't that simple, but just in that very moment, Christ became real to my brother. Why? Why? because of his love for him. I had been spending years trying to drag my brother to places like this. 
spending years loving on him and trying to, trying to do all these things and trying to show him. And there were times where he was drawn in, but then he would kind of skirt away, drawn in and then skirt away. But in this moment, he finally was faced with that decision. Am I going to do this? Am I going to follow Jesus or not? Here's what I want to leave you guys with, with that story. As you draw closer and closer to Christ, there will be things that stand out to you. Divine appointments that God will have for you to do radical things for his kingdom. But the thing is, is oftentimes we muddle up uh, our vision with sin. We live a life that's distracted because we're so focused on ourselves and we're not humbled and we're, we're just living a life trying to, instead of going from rags to riches, and that becomes our pursuit. We begin to think, how can I make a, a, an empire for myself? How can I live for my own comfort? How can I make whatever? And God's saying the opposite. I want you to, to live a, a place of humility. I want you to have a heart after me. I want you to know me. And when we begin to live that kind of life, as we're drawn to Christ and we begin to be faced with our sin, God begins to say, okay, here's some issues you need to deal with. Instead of us hiding away and saying, I don't want that. I don't want change. I want to hold on to this sin. All he asks us to do is to lay it down. And it's amazing what God can do when you choose to to repent. To say, God, I I don't want this sin in my life anymore. I choose to follow after you. I choose to live according to your life. And then God begins to say, okay, now here's the plan I have for you to set others free. God had to do a work in Moses. He had to stamp it with this this, um, event that basically said, you are going to step into my presence. I am going to send you out. But you have to make a choice to do what I ask of you. So tonight, as we split up into small groups, I want you to be thinking about that. I want you to be thinking, have you come to those crossroads in your life? Are you just kind of like dancing around with this whole, I like to be loved on, uh, but I don't really want to make a decision to follow Christ. I don't want to live, I don't want to give up the things of this world. I don't want to give up my freedom in this life. But the reality is, is Christ is calling you to a place of obedience for him, and there's no better place to be. So as we uh, pray, um, and as we split up into small groups, I, I really want you guys to think beyond yourselves, because the beauty of uh, God working in your life is he's going to work through your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray tonight. Lord God, that as you've been stirring in our hearts, even this week, God, with things that we may have uh, done this week um, that need to be repented for tonight, God, I pray that even in this moment, we will, um, God, be broken and come to you and and lay those things down. God, if we've been living a a life of just distraction and trying to uh, create uh, for ourselves comfort or even some form of of ease in this life and and purposefully slid by um, those difficult conversations with people, I pray, God, that tonight you'll begin to convict our hearts of those moments. I pray, God, that we will surrender to you tonight and allow for you, God, to fill us with your love with your holiness, with your righteousness, that we will be able to shine you and not ourselves, that we will be able to be uh, followers of Christ who choose to walk in obedience and allow for your grace, God, to shine through us. We love you, God. We're thankful for what you have done and what you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen.